Good morning and welcome to Live Oak Church. We are so glad you're here to worship the King with us today. Here are some announcements to help you and your family get plugged into the life of our church. After Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the church was established. A top priority of the church was Bible study. We continue to embrace that priority here at Live Oak Church. This is so in our children's ministry, our youth ministry, and our adult ministry as well. Typically, there are 18 to 20 adult small group Bible studies available to you throughout the week. We are launching two new studies in October. One of them is called Take Courage and is a Jennifer Rothschild women's Bible study of Haggai that will launch on Monday, October 3rd at 6.30 in our chapel and is led by Jan Tate. The second one will also launch is a Sunday school class for couples starting on October 2nd. This class will meet at 9.30 in the conference room and will be led by Todd and Celie Petavino. They will be looking at the miracles of Jesus. I hope you will get connected in one of our small group Bible studies. Hey guys, we have some very exciting news just for you. We have a Denal coming up. What's a Denal? Um, it's pronounced D now, and it means disciple now. It's a weekend where students 6th through 12th grade will have fun, fellowship, do a service project, worship, pray, and study the scriptures. That sounds like a lot of fun, but I'll still get the disciple part. It means that over time, we start to look more and more like Jesus. Really? This event is for students 6th through 12th grade, November 18th through 20th, and will be held right here at Live Oak Church. This will be a great weekend, and, and what are you doing? <laughs> I'm looking more like Jesus for D now. Um, you know that means on the inside, right? Oh. Hey, sign up on the church app or at the info desk in the lobby. We'll see you there. Today in the life of our church, we're kicking off a new sermon series, What We Believe. Let's prepare our hearts and expect to see God move today as we worship together as a community of faith. Good morning, Live Oak. So glad you're here in this Lord's Day. I pray to be blessed abundantly. There is a lot to be in prayer for, especially uh, our neighbors, our friends, our brothers and sisters in Florida. Uh, if any group knows what they're going through, we do here in Louisiana. So keep them in prayer. Uh, if you can help, if you can make your way down that way, if um, you want to send donations, let us know. Uh, whatever we can do to bring some hope and some relief to the people of Florida. So again, so glad you're here this morning as we're here to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords as we bow our heads in prayer. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for your grace and for your goodness. We thank you, God, for your light and for your life and for the love you give us. And God, I just pray this morning as we enter into this place that we will worship you in spirit and in truth, that we will proclaim your word, that we'll lift up the name of Jesus, the name above every name, that at your name, O oh God, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to your glory that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, Father, I pray that this will be, Father, our goal this day. This will be, Father, what we say and what we do as we preach, as we teach, as we sing, as we worship you. Lord God, I pray that your spirit will fill this place in such a way that our hearts will be touched, that our minds will be changed, Father, and be more conformed to you and to your word. So bless us now. Bless this time. Use it for your glory, for the good of your people. As we pray now all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen as we stand together and worship him. Good morning, church family. What a great day to be in the house of King Jesus. Let's lift our voice to him. Let's take this time to declare who he is, what he's done in our life. Lift your voice up to him. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails would not fail me now. You won't fail me. The waiting, the same God who's never late, is working all things out, working all things out.
make that choice this morning to give praise, to worship the King of Kings, the name that is above every name, the one who gives life, who gives hope, who gives healing, who gives forgiveness, who has restored us, brought us out of the pit, and given us life abundant in Him. For those who believe, for those who trust, He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise this morning. So let's choose to lift up hearts that are thankful, hearts that are grateful, and that our voices would then respond to sing out the praises of our Savior, the praises of our Lord, the only one who's worthy of shouting out His praise this morning. Let's sing this together. You give life, you are love.
moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Be seated again. What a what an amazing time to come to a place like this and to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is what it's all about. To take that time aside and say, Lord God, this is it's all about you. It's not about me. It's all about you. And when we do that, something amazing happens into our heart and life. This has been an incredible year so far. We're now in the fourth quarter of the year 2022. 
Amazing things have been happening, and there are three months left in this year, three months, again, of who knows what's going to happen. A lot of things on the horizon, but this much we do know. Uh, we serve a God who knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. He has us in his hand. He has given us promises, and when we invite him and include him to be a part of what we're doing in our hearts, in our lives, in our homes, in our marriages, and yes, even in our finances, amazing things begin to happen. So again, for all of you who are generous givers, thank you. God bless you, and I pray that God will continue to bless you. For those who are still struggling with giving, and I understand that struggle, I totally get it. I just want you to think about what it means to give and to include God in your finances. Uh, because here's what my wife and I have been saying, you know, for, for the last 40 years, and that is you can't outgive God. And when that reality hits you, and when that reality begins to work in your life, you begin to see God getting involved, amazing things happen. Now, Again, we really do need and really do want and encourage you to give because there's a lot happening between now and the end of the year. And if you're sitting there going, well, I just hate it when I come to church because all it does is make me beg for money, beg for money. Well, quit making me beg. Amen? <laughs> all you got to do is give and I'll stop begging. Amen? I'm just saying. Please think about it. Please pray about it. Because the, word, the will of God, the word of God, again, is going to go forth. And we want to invite you and let you be a part of it. Let's pray. And Father, we pray your blessings upon us. We pray, oh God, you'll use this time for your glory as we give to you, as we worship you, Father, with what you have given us. May we be good stewards, oh God, of, again, the finances and the provision, God, that you've given us as we give back to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we worship, as we continue to lift our voice together, I'm reminded of this song we're about to declare to the Lord of Genesis 22, the amazing story of Abraham taking his son Isaac up Mount Moriah to be obedient to the command of the Lord to give his one and only son. That is so beautifully fulfilled through the risen King Jesus on the cross. And we're just going to declare today, just like Abraham declared, as we can read in the scripture, that Mount Moriah is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is enough. Jehovah will provide is what that means. And we're going to declare to the Lord Jesus today, you are enough. He is always enough. More than we ask, think, or imagine, he's working in us and working in this place. So let's declare today. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to measure. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Going through, Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind that call me out. You would cross an ocean.
be seated and turn your Bible to 2 Chronicles as we begin a brand new series of sermons simply entitled, What Do We Believe? What, what do we believe? Because here's what we're going to share all month long. And what you believe determines everything about you. What you believe determines how you see life, how you see people, uh, how you see eternity, how you see God, how you see church, how you see worship. What you believe determines everything about you. So the first question this morning as we begin this series is, what do you believe about God? Now, whenever I ask that question, I get an assortment of answers. Uh, some believe that God, he's the man upstairs. Maybe he's a higher power. Uh, some will say, I'm not even sure there is a God. Uh, I went to graduate school and this and that, and I heard this lecture, and I just kind of gave up on the whole God thing. I mean, I mean, how do I know there is a God? No one can really know for sure, right? There is a God. And so you hear all these questions and all these responses to the question, what about your belief in God? So, again, all month long is going to be our focus. What do we believe? And as followers of Jesus, what do we believe about God? So here's what I do know about most people. When you're in trouble, God becomes real to you. Amen? When the doctor says to you, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do for you. All of a sudden, God becomes a little more real. When someone says, I'm sorry about your mom's your dad, your sister, your brother, your son, your daughter. There's nothing more we can do. God becomes very real at that moment. Because there's something deep down in you, like there's something deep down in me that knows in our heart and our soul, again, that we have been made by God and for God. And we can use all the arguments, we can have all the excuses, uh, we can say all the things that we heard in grad school or saw on TV or watched on the History Channel or saw on MSNBC or whatever it is that you're watching as to why we don't believe and why there's no God or whatever it may be. But the reality is when push comes to shove, here's what we all know, we want to know that God is there and God cares. And so it was a man named Jehoshaphat, not a good old-fashioned Bible name. You know, maybe your granddad would, you know, stub his toe and go, great, jumping Jehoshaphat, right? Okay. My grandfather did that. Anyway, <laughs> Jehoshaphat was a prophet. He's in a bunch of trouble in here in 2 Chronicles. He, there is a war coming against him. There is an army coming against him. He's not quite sure what to do. And he's not quite sure where to go, but he knows one thing, that God is there and God indeed cares. And here's where we pick it up in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. As he asks three questions, three questions, see if you can pick them up in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, beginning with verse 5. It says this, Then Jehoshaphat stood at the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, art thou not God in the heavens? And art thou not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in thy hand, so that no one can stand against thee. Verse 7. Did thou not, O Lord our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and give it to the descendants of Abraham, thy friend forever? And they lived in it, and have built thee a sanctuary there for thy name, saying, Should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment or pestilence or famine, Will we stand before this house and before thee, for thy name is in this house, and cry to thee in our distress, and thou wilt hear and deliver us. So Jehoshaphat is asking some questions. Are you not the God of heaven? Have you not been the God who delivered us? Will you not be the God that takes care of us? And these are the questions. This is the, the narrative, if you will, that Jehoshaphat is giving to his people. Then in Matthew chapter 6, a very familiar passage, Jesus is now teaching the disciples to pray. And he says something something that has never been said before. He's saying something about how we're to approach the God, our creator. And he says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. He says, so pray then in this way, our father, that was huge. 
You didn't pray. You didn't call God Father. As a matter of fact, if you're an Orthodox Jewish person, you probably wouldn't mention the name God at all, much less call him in a very intimate sort of way, Father. And the little sidebar, amazingly enough, the Apostle Paul takes it a step further. He says, we're not going to call God just our Father. We're going to call him Abba. Now, the word Abba in our vernacular would be like Papa or Dad or Pops. Imagine having that intimate relationship with God that you call him dad or papa. And so it is with Jesus. He's saying here, we're to pray this way. Heavenly Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And finally in John chapter 4, you know the story. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And they're having a very strong, deep theological discussion. And we pick it up in John chapter 4, beginning now with verse 19. It says this. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. For our fathers worship in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit truth. May the God who inspired these words now speak to us as we ask the question, so what do we know? What do we believe about God? Let's pray. And Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon us. I pray, O oh God, you will speak grace and truth to us today. And Lord God, may we each answer this question, what do we believe, God, when it comes to who you are and why we're here? And where we're going in our relationship with thee. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, perhaps the greatest question we can ask ourselves, or perhaps the greatest question we can ask others is, what do we believe about God? Or what do we know about God? You see, how you see God determines several things about you. See, over the years I've asked a question, over the years I've heard a variety of answers. When I ask that question, what do you believe about God, or how do you see God, or, or who is God, and I get a variety of, of responses. Uh, the first is this, some aren't sure God's there. I've heard that one a lot. They'll say, you know, I don't I even know if there is a God, Mark, and I'm sorry. When I look around, I see all the craziness in the world, and I see this, and I see that, and I see suffering. I'm just not sure, Mark, if there is a God or not. I've heard that one. Maybe... That's been your response. Maybe that's where you're coming from. Some may believe that God is there, however, but they'll say, well, God may be there, but I don't think God's involved. I mean, he may be out there somewhere, but I don't know. He, I don't even know if he's involved or not. I mean, the way things are going in my life, he's not involved with me. I can't say that he's there. Thirdly, some will say this. I think God's restrictive. And so, therefore, they avoid God. God won't let me do this, and God says, I can't do that, and God won't let me do this, and God says, that's wrong, and that's a sin. So I just kind of you know, keep God at arm's length. I mean, he may be out there, but you know what? I'm going to keep it at arm's length because I don't want him to say what I can and cannot do. And so, therefore, God is to be avoided. Some will say that God's always angry. He's always angry with me. Every time I you know, do this or say that or stub my toe or I go off on this, and I, God must be angry with me all the time. You know, he just wants to swat me you know, with his you know, divine you know, human swatter. All that. So he's just angry with me all the time. And some see God that way. Some see God as that higher power. Again, very impersonal. He's out there, but he's just a power. Kind of like you know, in Star Wars, you got the force. And that's kind of how I see God, some will say. Not only that, someone will go on to say, well, I think God is maybe a type of Santa Claus or a vending machine. I just do this and do that and do this and do that, and I ask for this and I expect that. And if I don't get it in 24 hours and I get mad at God, and he, he'll know that uh, I mean business. And then some see God as the creator, the redeemer, their sustainer, their heavenly father. So here, here's the point. How we see God determines many things 
about us. How we see God, how we approach God, what we believe about God, what we think about God determines many things about us. But here are the top three, I'll argue. Number one, whether or not we worship. Here's, here's the truth. We all worship something or someone. And how we see God determines how we worship or if we worship. But again, we all worship something. Please understand, even an atheist worships something. We all worship something or someone. And you can look at the criteria by asking this. Anything we give our allegiance to has the potential of our worship. Anything that we're loyal to, anything we give money to, anything that we say that we love, anything we focus on, anything we get excited about can become an object of our worship. And here's what I've observed. You've seen this as well. We've all recognized this. That what happens in concert halls what happens in stadiums or arenas and what happens in churches all have a very interesting parallel. You think about that. What we see going on in stadiums, concert halls, arenas, and churches all have a very interesting parallel. And sometimes we need to ask questions who or what do we actually worship? Because if we're going to be really, really honest with ourselves, here's what we all know, ladies and gentlemen. We all have our idols. We do. We all have our idols. As a matter of fact, the human mind is a great idol factory. I'll say that again. The human mind is a great idol idol factory. And we're good at making idols. And if you don't realize that about yourself, then you'll never pause and really examine who or what it is that you worship and perhaps never really turn to the one worthy, worthy of our praise. Next, how you see God determines how you see yourself. You see, those who have a healthy belief in God, they see themselves that they've been fearfully and wonderfully made by God and for God. They realize that God has created them with a divine purpose, that God has given them this moment in time in world history, that God has given them an eternal meaning, eternal value, and that what you say and that what you do during this time on earth really does matter. You are not an accident, that you have been made by God and for God for such a time as this. He knows you by name. The Word of God makes it clear. He knows every hair on your head. He knows when you get up in the morning, when you lie down at night. He knows every thought that crosses your mind. He is an eternal God. You've been made by Him and for Him with divine purpose. And when you understand that about God and you see that and recognize that, amazing things begin to happen. But ladies and gentlemen, here's what I know. If a person doesn't believe they've been made by God or they have some like token belief, then they see themselves as a cosmic accident with no real purpose, no real meaning. As a matter of fact, many who have no real belief in God will say this, that all these social constructs in our world, they can be deconstructed. If all these social constructs, because they'll say, who says who's a man or a woman? Who says what's right or wrong? Who says what's good or evil? And in their heart and mind, if there is no God, it's all one big social construct that they can now deconstruct. They will say things like, I don't have to follow the social constructs. I do what I want. So how you see God determines how you see yourself. So life is either all about me or it's about the one who created me. So how you see God determines how you see yourself. And thirdly, hear this. What you believe about God also determines the message that you're wanting to share with the world. Now, again, we all have our messages, don't we? You said this about other people. Well, that was a message, wasn't it? They didn't show up. They said this. They said that. They didn't go here. They went there. Uh, they didn't look my way. They wouldn't even look at me in the eye. That was a message, wasn't it? So we all have a message, don't we? We all have a message that we want to share with the world. We all have a message that we want to share with others. So here's the point. Because we have this message, that message, ladies and gentlemen, determines or is determined based on what we believe about God. You have a message. In other words, there is something you want people to know. You have a message. There is something you want people to know. So here's my question. What's your message? 
What is it that you want people to know? What is your message? Because you have one. Every song has a message. Every sermon has a message. Every facial expression has a message. Amen? Every word you say has a message. So here's my question. So what's your message? For some, their message is this. You do know I'm better than you, don't you? That's their message, right? You, you know those people. You, you, you've, you've been around that blessing. I am better than you. Or some is, I'm in charge here. Or some, I'm in control here. For some, their message is, it's all about me. Or for some, their message is, I have more, and mine is better, and mine is prettier. That's the message, and you need to understand that message. For some, again, it's all about how amazing I am and how amazing you're not. That is the message of so many people. Here's how Dr. Albert Adler, one of the pioneers of modern psychology, put it. He said, quote, he said, our quest as humans is to be superior to those around us. He goes on to say, that desire to be superior drives our need to control others, be better than others, and dominate others. So the reason why we act the way we do, according to Dr. Adler, is there's something inside of us that wants to be better, that wants to be superior. That's why we talk down to people. That's why we try to control people. That's why we have this need to win or compete. And again, so the control freaks in your life, they have a message. And their message is, again, I'm in control, you need to submit to me or else. And that's why you've all heard that phrase. That again, we have this desire for power. And power, again, corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's something inside of all of us, part of our sin nature, many will argue, we want to control or dominate those around us. So how you see God determines your message. See, the message of Jesus was simple. Jesus had a message, by the way. We all know that, right? Jesus had a message, and the message of Jesus was amazing. It was so simple. Here's the message of Jesus, for those of you who may have missed it. His message was simply this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. And that was the message of Jesus. He walked on this planet. He walked among us to give us that message. So the truth is this. More consequences for thought and action follow the affirmation or denial of God than answering any other basic question. I'll say that again. More consequences for thought and action will follow the affirmation or the denial of God more than any other question that could ever be asked. So again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, understand this. We need to know one thing, that we are surrounded by skeptics, aren't we? We're surrounded by non-believers. We're surrounded by those who are the sarcastic agnostic. I've been around these individuals, so have you. Maybe you're one out there. I don't know. The reality is we know them. And skepticism and non-belief and whether or not there's a God is something that we see all around us. If you go to any university or if you talk to that person down the hall where you work, or maybe there's that brother-in-law who doesn't believe anything, here's what we know. They're going to give their outdated arguments. When you talk to the non-believer, you talk to the skeptic, they will always give you their outdated arguments that when cross-examined or when new evidence is presented, falls like a house of cards. See, of all the subjects in the world, of all the things you can study in grad school or college, wherever you may be, there is one area, there is one program, there is one subject that will not allow you to cross-examine it. Do you know what that subject is? There is one. You can cross-examine various philosophical views, various theological views, various scientific views, laws of physics sometimes, or cross-examined even. But there's one thing, that will, one area that will never let you be cross-examined, and it is the subject of evolution. You cannot cross-examine. It's not allowed. The theory, the hypothesis perhaps at best, of the subject of evolution. It's not allowed. Colleges, universities, grad schools, Bio 101 will not allow anyone to cross-examine it. And here's why. The moment you cross-examine it, you know what I'm talking about cross-examining, right? In a court of law, you know, you have the examination, the cross-examination. When you cross-examine evolution, it falls like a house of cards. 
Here are at least five things that have been discovered recently, ladies and gentlemen, in the last 50 years that have, again, destroyed the pillars of evolution. Number one, the fossil record does not support evolution. Did you know that? Darwin himself declared evolution stands or falls on the fossil record. Dr. Colin Patterson of the British Museum of Natural History said, quote, of all the millions of fossils at our disposal, we have no fossils that support evolution. The author T.H. Morgan said this in his book, Evolution and Adaptation, we have not one single instance of one species transforming into another. Number two, DNA, the complex code of life, with 3.1 billion bits of information that determine every living thing, from the kelp in the ocean to the cactus in the desert. Every living thing, again, is based upon its DNA. It declares there's intellect because, again, for there to be information, there must be intellect. And DNA is simply information. That's why Francis Collins, who mapped the human DNA, said, quote, I felt I was looking at the book of life and the handiwork of God. Number three, that probiotic or that prebiotic soup that, again, that had to be around in order for evolution to happen, kind of bubbling, you know, like a, kind of cauldron, and all of a sudden everything comes together. Could have never happened. Why? Because the atmosphere is either filled with oxygen or UV radiation. Therefore, these chemical reactions could have never happened. Number four, mathematical probability says evolution could have never happened. Again, here's how they put it. What are the odds of ten monkeys in a room together with ten computers creating the Encyclopedia Britannica? How long is that going to take us? Ten monkeys. We'll give you 20 monkeys. We'll give you 100 monkeys with 100 of the top computers. And we'll wait for that Encyclopedia Britannica to be published, right? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, here's what we know. Mathematical probability says there is no way that by random chance, everything you see around you, everything in the universe, the great complexity, the detail that we see in our world and our universe could have happened by random chance. Last of all, the founders of evolu evolution said this, quote, the reason we embraced evolution, this is Julian Huxley and Thomas Huxley, some of the disciples of Darwin. The reason why we embraced evolution, here's what they said, was not because there is any science behind it, but the thought of God interfered with our lifestyle. Now I'm keeping it G-rated, okay? The thought of God interfered with our lifestyle. That's why we embraced evolution. There's no science behind it, they said. There is no observation. There is no testing. There is no repeated experiments. We just realized the thought of God interfered with our lifestyle. Isn't that amazing? And I'm sure every freshman in biology class at every university heard that quote somewhere, right? I'm sure they all began their class of evolution with that particular quote. Maybe not. Maybe not. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what I know. In the last 50 years, there have been seven discoveries that point to God. We've talked about them before. This is a review for many of you. But number one, the space-time theorems that declare the universe indeed had a beginning, which means there must be a causal agent outside of space and time. Bourdais, Lincoln, and Guth all concluded that any universe that expands on average has a creator. These men were not Christians. These men were not even believers in God. They just followed the science and said any universe that expands on average has a creator behind it. Number two. Thus, we have observed our universe had a beginning. The Bible references, by the way, at least 11 times an expanding universe. You see, it wasn't until 1924 that we knew our universe was expanding, but the Bible told us at least 11 times that it was. Number three, the laws of physics are constant. By the way, that's referenced in Jeremiah 33. That's referenced in the book of Ecclesiastes. That's referenced in the book of Romans. Long before science discovered the laws of physics. And here's another question. If there are laws, there must be a law giver. Amen? 
If there's laws of physics that do not change, that are constant, there must be a lawgiver. Number four, fine-tuning in our world, in our universe, from the rotation of our earth, the magnetic poles, the dark matter of the universe, everything, hear this, is so fine-tuned, it could have never happened by random chance. So says the science of mathematical probability. Not only that, we can now observe the beginning of the universe. We have the telescopes that can see when the universe actually began. Mark, I'm not sure if I believe that. Stay with me. When you look at the sun, S-U-N, you're not seeing the sun the way it is right now at this very second. You're seeing the sun how it was eight minutes ago. That's how long it takes for light to travel to planet Earth. So we can look back with the high-powered telescopes at our disposal. And by the way, we just happen to be in the right location of our galaxy to be able to see the universe in a very unique and wonderful way. And I'm sure that's just a coincidence. I'm just, I'm just you know, I'm sure that's just how it works. But we're in the right spot in a galaxy that can see the very beginning of the universe. Not only that, the fossil record points that life appeared suddenly and not gradually. So thus God who created, who designed, who fine-tuned has also revealed the fact that he is indeed the creator of the world. The Bible begins this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. One of the most scientific statements you'll ever hear. But he's also revealed his laws of physics. He's revealed his laws of morality. He's revealed, again, who he is. He's revealed that he is the God who provides and forgives and brings salvation. He has revealed that he is the God, again, who adopts us as his very own. If we'll just turn to him and call upon his name. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, here's what I know. We get to call the God who created the heavens and the earth, Heavenly Father, Abba, Papa, Dad, Pops. That is how intimate we get to be with our Heavenly Father who has created us, who sustains us, who has redeemed us. You see, here's what I know about God, what he has revealed. He is a loving parent. And he loves being a loving parent who has revealed his will to the nation of Israel, through the prophets, through his Son. And here's what God has revealed about himself through the nation of Israel and through his prophets and through his son, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. That first of all, he is merciful. He has compassion. What does that mean? It means this. He understands you. Now, I know your husband has a hard time understanding you. I know your wife has a hard time understanding you. I, I get it. I know your kids scratch their head and go, what's up with dad? I mean, what's up with mom? I mean, come on. God does it. God never scratches his head and goes, what's up with her? What, 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 what did you do? What? No, he gets it. He knows you. He understands you. He understands everything about you. He knows who you are. He knows what you do. He knows why you do it. And the word of God says he has compassion. He is merciful. Number two, he is filled with grace. Grace is giving us goodness, hope, life. At his expense. It's goodness and blessing that we don't deserve, that he pours onto his people. See, every Christian knows one thing they don't deserve blessing, but they're grateful for it. They don't deserve it, but they're so thankful for it. He gives grace, and that grace brings hope. He gives grace, and that grace brings life. He gives grace, and that grace brings love. He gives grace, and that grace brings understanding. Thirdly, he is truth. What he says is indeed absolute. He is long-suffering, which is a fancy word for saying he's patient. You see, God is not surprised by you. God is not surprised what you say or what you do or what you don't say or what you do. You don't surprise God. Again, God never looks at you and looks at me and goes, I didn't see that coming. I mean, man, huh, what, what now? Angels, any idea? No. He doesn't say that. He is not surprised by you. He is patient. He is long-suffering. And on your worst day, on your worst day, when you do it all wrong, when you say it all wrong, he is your very best friend who has promised he will never let go of your hand. He is faithful even when we're not. 
Because that's what a loving parent is all about. He is forgiving. How forgiving is God? Just look at the cross. Look at the cross and know this. Everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done, will say, thought about saying, thought about doing, will do, has been forgiven at the cross. The cross, ladies and gentlemen, takes care of all of our sin, and therefore God can be a forgiving God. His goodness, God brings blessing into our life. Here's what I know. We are the most blessed people on this planet right here, right now, today. We really are. Take the 8 billion people on this planet, and I guarantee you every one of them would trade places with us on any given day. How blessed are we? Amen. Give him praise and glory. It's all about him. How blessed are we? And last of all, number seven, we could go over several more. But number seven, if you kind of keep in score, keep in count, he's just. He is a just, gracious, loving, patient God. So God works in your life, especially when the enemy approaches. God works in your life, especially when the storms come. God works in your life, especially when the battle begins. So we ask three questions, just like Jehoshaphat. Are you not... Are you not the God of heaven? Are you not the God who brings hope and healing? Are you not the God that has my beginning and my eternity and my everything in your hands? Are you not that God? And he would say, yes, I am that God. That's what Jehoshaphat was saying. Did you not, he said. Did you not help me? Did you not provide for me? Did you not comfort me? Did you not assure me? Did you not lead me? Did you not give me? See, Jehoshaphat is doing something that sometimes we don't do. He remembered all the times and all the ways that God was there for him. Just for a moment, take, take 10 seconds, and just for a moment in the theater of your mind, think back on all the times God was there for you. How he brought you through things. That he was carrying you even when you didn't realize it. You got that blessing, you got that phone call, you got that check, you got that comfort, you got that person who put their arm around you, you got that person that says, it's going to be okay. That person came into your life, God showed up, he brought, he carried you, he gave you strength beyond your own, he gave you a love beyond your own. And so Jehoshaphat, yes, says, did you not, did you not provide for me and comfort me and assure me and lead me? He's not forgetting. And then thirdly, he says, will you not? Will you not? Will you not judge my enemies? Will you not put your arms around me again? Will you not lead me into your presence again? So when you see God, and here's the closing point. As your heavenly father, here's what I know about you. Number one, your worship changes. Why? Because there's something inside of you that is so full of thanksgiving. You cannot help but worship him. You cannot help but love him. When you are reminded of all that he's done, all that he's going to do, the promises he's given, and the way he has worked in your life, your worship changes. Here's what I know. Secondly, your self-worth changes. Because you realize I've been made by God. I've been made for God. He is my heavenly father. I belong to him. I have been adopted by him. I'm in his hands. And 10 billion trillion years from now, I'm going to still be in his hands. What a God we serve. And thirdly, your message changes. God is now the source of your life. He is now the source of your blessing. He is now the source of your hope. He is now the source of your salvation. And that's why we're called to trust in the one who created you. Trust in the one who sustains you. Trust in the one who redeems you. And call upon his name. And he will be your heavenly father. That's the God that we serve. May we pray. And heavenly father, we thank you. That, Lord God, you have called us to rest in your grace and your promises and your care. That, Lord God, you have given us life abundant and life eternal the moment we called upon your name. So, God, speak grace and truth into our hearts this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here at Live Oak, our tradition is to celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, on the first 
the first Sunday of the month. And hopefully you have your communion packet. If not, raise your hand high and Stephen or Mark will bring you a communion packet. Now Jesus was celebrating Passover with his disciples. And he took some bread, bread that was unleavened or sinless. Bread that had been on a grill, striped. Bread that had been pierced to see if it was done. And then bread that had been smacked and broken into pieces. And he took this piece of bread as a picture and he said to his disciples, this is my body that's broken for you. And now when you do this, he said, I want you to remember me. In front of each disciple, there are four cups. And Jesus reached for the cup of redemption. And he quoted a verse that basically said that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And he took the fruit of the vine and he says, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Again, that verse referenced that moment. He says, now when you do this, I want you to remember me. This is a moment of hope, of intimacy, of life, of love. This is what happens when you come together in a loving, gracious moment. This is what our Heavenly Father wants from you and from me each day of our life that closeness, that intimacy, that love. For that's the God that we serve. As we stand for our closing prayer. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and for your goodness. We thank you, God, that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made by you and for you. Help us, O oh God, to remember the words you've taught us this day and the words you've taught us to pray. The words of our Lord and Savior, we pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Give him praise and glory in the house of God.